Hello friends, welcome to MP Cloud Monastery uh, for our monk chat where you can have the opportunity to ask questions live to the monastic Sangha. Uh, that tonight is comprised of myself, Ayasoma, and Bhante Sudasa on my right and Bhante Jay to my left. And uh, welcome to all the friends that are checking in. Hello to Gita, Magyarho, Gita the <laughs> second, Kumu, Karen, Jake, Jayanta. Good to see you online as well, and everyone else who hasn't checked in yet. Uh, so whenever we're, you're ready, you're welcome to type in uh, any questions you might have related to Buddha Dhamma and Sangha, and we'll try our best to answer them. This also applies to all our residents here tonight. If you have any lingering question. Um, there is not a specific topic, so just as long as it's related somewhat to Buddhism, we we can try uh, to answer. And hello to Vivian and Bumika as well. No questions yet, so maybe... Um, this might be the shortest mug chat on record. We always say that at the very beginning and then... <laughs> I think Richard, hello, good to see you. It takes time for things to kind of catch up. Manal, welcome. And hello to Laura, Laura or Laura, if you're Italian. <laughs> ah, we have a question. All right, so Richard asks. What exactly is Samatha? Would right view, right intention, Vipassana need to be in place for cultivation? And how does it interrelate with Samadhi, Sati, and Sampajanna? Dante, would you like to address this? Yeah, that's actually a very broad question that you've asked with um, many parts that we could go into in a lot of detail. So first off, the word Samatha uh, literally means peacefulness. Uh, so, in particular, uh, samatha refers both to a quality of mind, so the quality of peacefulness uh, in the mind, and also to practices, particularly meditation practices, which help to cultivate peacefulness in the mind. Uh, so, samatha practices include most concentration exercises, such as uh, mindfulness of the body or mindfulness of breathing, uh, it also includes the Brahma Viharas, so practices like loving kindness meditation, compassion meditation, and so on. Those also are forms of samatha, practices that develop peacefulness of mind. Uh, also, recollection of Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, one's own virtue, one's own generosity, recollection of the devas. These are all practices which help to bring about a peaceful state of mind. Uh, and uh, another good example is the Vitaka Santana Sutta, the discourse on the five ways of stabilizing one's mind. Uh, that gives five overall strategies for how to cultivate peacefulness of mind. And uh, right view, right intention, and Vipassana need to be in place for cultivation. Um, well, the truth is that when we first start practicing Buddhism, our view tends to be a little bit off and our intentions may or may not be in line uh, and vipassana is also usually a bit lacking so in the beginning we're trying to develop those traits so and the more we develop them then the more effective our practice becomes so when our mm, views are, are very correct very precise then that supports our practice uh, but also the more we practice, the more that tends to support the growth of right view. Uh, similarly, right intention, the intention to purify the mind of unwholesome states and to cultivate wholesome mind states. Uh, that's actually the basic motivation behind Buddhist practice. It's the basic uh, prerequisite for doing any kind of Buddhist practice is the wish to cultivate wholesome mind states and reduce unwholesome mind states. And Vipassana, um, does it need to be in place for cultivation? Uh, rather, Vipassana is something that we develop. Uh, so it's the, the insight that we develop uh, through mm, practicing the path. Uh, and in particular, it's the application of right view to our experience. So as we come to an understanding of the Buddhist teachings and we 
apply that to how we relate to our, our experiences, uh, then that is how Vipassana grows. That's how insight grows. And how does this interrelate with Samadhi, Sati, and Sapajanya? Well, Samadhi is unification of mind, collectedness of mind. Uh, and this is necessary because the mind needs to be very stable and steady in order to see things clearly. Uh, sati is, is mindfulness, which is, again, if you want to understand your experience, you have to pay attention to it. Uh, you need to be clearly aware of, of what's going on. Um, and, some, and so mindfulness is necessary both for concentration practice, because you need to be mindful of your concentration object. And mindfulness is also necessary for insight practice, because you need to pay attention to whatever you're trying to cultivate insight towards. So whether you're practicing uh, samatha or vipassana, so it's necessary to have mindfulness. It's necessary to have sati. And sampajanya and it usually goes together with sati. So sampajanya has the meaning of uh, clear, complete, comprehensive understanding. Um, so not just being generally aware of what's going on, but having a clear, sharp understanding of what's going on. Uh, so that's usually related with wisdom. Uh, so the, the wisdom which understands our experience, which knows what's happening. Uh, rather than just a, a general, vague, confused awareness, uh, Sampajanya brings this sharp, clear, knowing awareness uh, to our experience. So that's how all of that fits together. Excellent. Thank you, Bhaktim. And Magar Hall, Magar Hall says, do you think the consciousness that doesn't cease when an hour hand passes away that Ajahn Tanisaro writes about is in the suttas? Consciousness without surface. I am actually not familiar with what um, Ajahn Jeff writes about this. Um, do you want to? Me neither. This was brought up in my own community a little bit. And, and I really, I have to read up on this because I'd be very, very surprised that, that Tenisaro is saying that there's a consciousness like that exists past Parinibbana or something like that. I don't know. What is Bhante? It might have to do also with perhaps what um, we were addressing with Ajahn Pathano when he was here, right, Bhante, about the kind of sometimes confusion of terminology between the Thai forest tradition and the terminology used in the suttas. So the forest masters, I mean, the Thai forest tradition has many incredible qualities and we're all big fans of the Thai forest tradition, but usually the Ajahns weren't scholars. Uh, so they would have sometimes a way of, this is what Ajahn Pasanda anyway was um, sharing with us, that um, perhaps their choice of words wasn't necessarily according to the textbook, um, but rather they were trying to use words to express um, certain experiences that are wordless. And so it's a little bit, sometimes it can lead to confusion if we're trying to map out, like if we're being too technical about things and trying to kind of sort of map them out with uh, what it says in the suttas. Um, I don't know if Bhante, you have any thoughts on the matter, if you're familiar with Ajahn Jeff's theory. Uh, I'm not familiar with, with this in particular. Um, so I'm kind of generally aware of this ongoing debate around the words, the word chitta, which we usually translate as mind. Um, as far as vinyana goes, so generally speaking, we would say that the only thing which is not subject to arising and ceasing is nibbana, the nibbana datu or the asankata datu. That's the only thing which is not subject to arising and ceasing. So all forms of consciousness are sankharas mm -hmm. and therefore are subject to arising and mm -hmm. ceasing. Uh, this would be the answer from the suttas. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is this one peculiar passage which appears only a couple places in the suttas about vinyanang anidasanang. And there's a lot of debate among scholars as to just what the heck that term means. And there's not any real consensus. But if you want to read about it, there's actually some really great detailed articles on the subject in on Sutta Central. Um, uh, Bhante Sujato wrote a series of articles about Vinyanang Aridasanang. Uh, I think the first article was called Nibbana is not Vinyana. 
And the second one was called something like Nibbana is still not Vinyana. <laughs> and the third article was something like Nibbana is really not Vinyana. Really, it's not. <laughs> so it was, it was this series of articles where he lays out very clearly that consciousness uh, is not Nibbana. It's subject, consciousness is subject to rising and ceasing. Mm -hmm. And that includes Vinyanang Anidasana. So Vinyanang Anidasana, which gets translated many various ways, non-manifest consciousness is, uh, I think how Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it, consciousness without surface would be a very strange translation, but that might be what that's translating as Vinyanang Anidasana. What brings up to my mind is, I mean, I, and again, this could be totally off, but I think about like the, the states of being where there's little to no rupa. It's just mm. like, you know, maybe it's like consciousness. That's what is that? The, the one consciousness where you're like basically a mind main being in the, in the space for like 84,000 eons because you practice the Arupa jhanas. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one theory. Yeah. As to yeah. Vinyana and refers to the formless states of being. Anyway, briefly speaking, Vinyana is not Nibbana. Vinyana is a Sankara. It's subject to arising and ceasing like everything else. So, no, there is no such thing as a consciousness that doesn't cease. People really get hung up on consciousness in Buddhism. Well, everywhere, but in I mean, Buddhism according to this, yes, but yes. we don't know exactly what Ajahn Jeff is referring to. So, it might also be the phrasing that can be a little bit tricky when reported. So, we're not officially saying that Ajahn Jeff is wrong. <laughs> we we do, we're saying that we don't know what Ajahn Jeff is um, talking about because we haven't read that. And, and as Bhante said, there are many, many things that many very serious, famous monastics will say different things about. It's just part of the par for the course. Exactly. <clears throat> and Bill Stewart says, what are your thoughts about laying down to meditate? Well, it's uh, the fourth meditation posture uh, that the Buddha taught. And um, we generally recommend it only for very advanced practitioners or insomniacs. Um, <laughs> so if you're either of these two, then you should definitely practice laying down to meditate. If um, you're neither, well, you can still practice laying down to meditate, but very likely it will somewhat turn into taking a nap while pretending to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually uh, what it turns out to be. But it's good to experiment uh, here and there. Definitely during on long retreats, um, it can be very, very useful. If the mind is really restless, actually. That's when I would um, really find a lot of benefit in, in practicing laying down. Um, if the mind had the hindrance of restlessness and agitation, then I would lie down in the posture that actually automatically relaxes you, sort of soothes the mind. But because you're restless, you're not sleepy, so that you can kind of use your hindrance to your advantage rather than the other way around. Venerable, do you have any any thoughts on the matter? That's good. Okay. Manal asks... Are the asavas related to the panthetters? If not, how are they similar and or different? Bhante Jay? Mm. So uh, I would not... There's a little bit of a relation, I would say. So so the, the term uh, that I think that both the fetters and the asavas uh, the, would fit under is kilesas, uh, defilements. Um, these are all various defilements of mind that keep us in the samsaric state, right? And, and indeed, the Buddha, when the Buddha saw the um, the destruction of the uh, the asavas, the taints, um, or the flows, or various different ways people translate it, um, then that was that was the the breakthrough, the the final breakthrough into um, nibbana uh, awakening. So. I, I guess what I would say is that these are all different. I, I even like really researched this a while back and I made a little mind map trying to figure all this out. And you, you see, you, in, from what I can understand, like the 10 fetters, the anusias, which are the, the, the underlying habitual tendencies, the asavas, all of these are, would fall under the, the general term of kilesa, defilements. I don't know if Bhante has anything else to... 
I think that sums it up pretty well. Um, but and briefly speaking, each of the fetters can be classified under one of the asavas. So the asavas is just a, a more concise formulation, uh, whereas the fetters is specifically mapping out the progress towards awakening. Right, thank you. And um, Shadow of Label says, what is the system related in your corner of Buddhism that is related to Dantians and Chakras? There isn't one. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah uh, Dantian is a Taoist concept and Chakras is predominantly a Hindu concept, though it also crops up in uh, certain segments of Tibetan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and good to see you all, friends. Jake says, what are some important points of etiquette to keep in mind when visiting a monastery for the first time? There's a small vihara in my city, and I want to make sure I introduce myself respectfully. Oh, that's very lovely. <laughs> um, any thoughts, Pante, Jake? Yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> what I would say is this. First, find if they have a website. Read whatever you can on the website. That's the first thing. Second, get a number, call them and ask them, well, wh when's the best time for somebody to come visit, right? Like one of the best times here at Empty Cloud is Sunday, Sunday mornings, right? You can come and help work. You can come and be part of the big meal. And then the, uh, you know, we have the, the session afterwards. So most places will have those kind of times where it's more for a public time and times where it's more really for just the residents to be private. So the, the, the best information, the best thing is to try to find as much information out um, as possible beforehand. Um, and then when you go, uh, you know, what I would say is be extremely mindful and aware of everything going around, on around you. Watch and observe. Right. And don't, uh, you know, just see what other people are doing. Nine times out of ten. You're going to look like a deer in the headlights. You're going to look like it's going to be obvious that you're new and somebody will come up to you and say, oh, hello, welcome. And, and they'll kind of, um, you know, uh, take you under their wing and, and, and kind of get you involved. And in, in so that, you know, you work out. But but mostly what I would say is just always being very mindful, very aware, um, you know, very quiet, dignified, you know. Uh, questioning also fine just to so that you can and being open to instruction and being open to the like teach me what I'm what I should be doing as a lay person when I come to the monastery Excellent. thank you and Jay Lyles asks what is meant by the signless concentration of mind so I think you're referring to Animita Samadhi which is actually quite present throughout the Pali Canon and also fun fact a lot of the theories in the Tirigata say exactly that. They're like, and then I just went dwelling in <laughs> the signless concentration of mind in Animita Samadhi. Or the Buddha actually instruct, instructs them to do precisely um, that. Um, and yes, well, another thing that comes to mind is actually when uh, Ajahn Jayanto, uh, who's a Thai forest monk uh, from the Ajahn Chah tradition, came to New York to, to lead a retreat. And um, at a certain point, after the first day, uh, someone asked him the question in a box. We couldn't ask, it was a science retreat, so everything was written down. Um, and uh, they asked him, are you teaching us Shikantaza? <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, I don't know what Shikantaza is. <laughs> Which is basically the Japanese um, Zen uh, meditation practice of just sitting is usually translated as just sitting. And essentially, all his instructions were about animita samadhi, so silence concentration, so without taking one precise object. And so we tend to think that that is just Mahayana, but actually it's not. It's just Buddhism, and it's um, very much present throughout the, um, throughout the suttas. I don't know if Bante... and, um, I've given many talks on the subject, so you can look up one of the, the past talks on the subject. And Sud says, I didn't understand what you said about vinyana dasanam. Is it like personal awareness seen everywhere? 
So as I mentioned, there's a lot of debate about what Vinyanang Anidasanang means. I remember one time I, I asked Bhikkhu Bodhi, like, what is Vinyanang Anidasanang? And he laughed and he said, uh, when there are strange, obscure things that only appear one or two places in the suttas, it's usually better not to think too much about them. Mm. That was his advice. And this is coming from one of the foremost Buddhist scholar monks in the English speaking world, if not the foremost. Um, so his advice is basically he said that the debates on Vinyanang Anidasanang are endless and unresolvable. So there's no point in thinking too much about it because you will not think your way to an answer. Uh, so that was Bhikkhu Bodhi's advice. Great, thank you, Bantem. Maybe you also want to take this one. What are the Upakilesas? I um, heard the term yesterday with regard to the Tipatana Sutta. Are they explained in the Upakilesa Sutta? They're mentioned in the Upakilesa Sutta, but um, actually one of the best places for a description of the Upakilesas is actually in the Vatupama Sutta which is Majjhima Nikaya um, 6 or 7, pretty early in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Vatupama Sutta or Vatta Sutta, the simile of the cloth. Mm -hmm. That's a place where the Buddha talks about upakulesas in quite some detail. Uh, so the actual sutta called the Upakulesa Sutta, as I recall, actually has less information about upakulesas than the Vatupama Sutta does. Um, but you should, I mean, realistically, you should just be reading the entire Majjhima Nikaya cover to cover. So you'll get both suttas and a bunch of other great ones as well. Great. Richard asks, how one can maintain a cool and peaceful mind and prevent it from becoming hot and agitated when unexpected or overwhelming kilesas arise? Hmm. You're talking about external, I mean, you say, you're saying kalesis here, so I'm assuming internal, like something is arising in the mind. Um, fall back always, 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 always fall back to satipatthana, to investigating. Whatever comes up in the mind, <clears throat> if you can switch to investigator mode, switch to say, okay, this has arisen in my mind. You know, this is going to take me away. Why don't I try to investigate it instead? Why don't I try to understand it? <clears throat> and when you do that, it loses some of its power over you. Um, you, you. It's not that you just totally control it, but it's just that you are able to kind of back away. It's like stepping back so you can, like, you can question it and investigate it and think about it. So whenever these kind of hot and agitated things arise in the mind, your best bet is to try to understand it, to try to know it as deeply as possible. I, you, you might be able to, um, you know, if one of these uh, chelases are going to, you know, are pushing you towards doing something really, really seriously unskillful, um, harmful, you know, illegal, dangerous, you know, these kind of things, then maybe you have to, um, apply some as the Buddhist is like crushing mind with mind or trying really strong willpower to keep yourself from doing them. But other than that, for the most part, it's just a matter of understanding, investigating, knowing, because if you don't know them, then they're just going to run roughshod over. They're just going to take you over. It's just, oh, well, you know, we're doing this now and you have no say in over. So you have to know it. You have to investigate it. You have to understand it. This is where I, I hate using this term because of the, the connotations and people get it confused with like anatta and things like that. It's, it's a horrible thing. But the Thai, the Thai forest term, the one who knows, right? Like that's what I kind of think of when I think of my, when I detach and become the investigator. Right when I say, "Oh, oh, this is coming. This is in my mind. Let me explore this. Let me investigate this." Right, that's a different part of your mind that is able to um, be that mindful, stable investigation, e exploration, and not be wrapped up with um, you know these defilements that are arising. Again, you're not going to fully overcome them, but you can at least learn from them, understand them. Great, thank you, Bantem. 
and Martin asks, it would be great if you could say some words on joy, bliss, sukha in Buddhism. Often Buddhism is seen as rather anti-hedonistic, but sukha plays an important role, no? I would say, actually, what comes to mind is um, I'm doing this course actually with uh, on the Satipatthana Sutta. Um, and um, actually, it's with Venerable Analio and um, uh, Venerable Damadina, the other Italian bikuni actually that exists in World War II. Uh, one is here, and the other one is in Italy, and I'm studying with her. Um, but anyway, Banti Analio in uh, the instructions or his Dhamma talk on Vedana, um, so on observing pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neutral feelings. He actually shared this reflection that just rings so true to me these days that <laughs> um, I've been like experiencing a lot of dukkha with the body. And um, I was just observing, even when the body is not ill doesn't have a particular illness it's such a source of unpleasant sensations and so his dhamma talk was essentially pretty much about really reflecting on how unpleasant most of our experience with the body even when it's not sick it's actually unpleasant and we're trying to relieve that unpleasantness so like for example if even if we sit for a period of time we're trying to relieve that unpleasantness by moving or um, even if we're having a nice experience, we're eating ice cream. Well, after a while, then we're trying to release the unpleasant feeling of having eaten ice cream and being feeling a little bit like ick <laughs> or whatever it is. So the actual sukha um, with the body is min minuscula, minu minuscule, minuscule, tiny. <laughs> it's tiny. And the unpleasantness, it's actually pretty much the majority of our experience and so he's kind of like well but so bizarre that we're trying to find this body as this sort of resource of pleasant um you know pleasant feelings we kind of should just like give up already and <laughs> and if we're really searching for sukha to the only thing that is reliable really for for pleasant feelings is the mind um, so all the different concentration states. Um, the, but even without getting to sublime states of concentration, we can even think when we're experiencing, when we're doing metta meditation, the mind feels really great. We're like, oh, this is some really great sukha. And actually that sukha is not blameful. And it's not that when we're talking even about Sometimes these words can be very charged, blameful or blameless. And there seems to be this kind of like really moral, whatever. Oh, this is good and this is bad. But rather it's what is conducive to um, suffering and what is conducive to the cessation of suffering. So the, yeah, the pleasure that comes through cultivating the mind, to the pleasure that comes with concentrating the mind or the pleasure that comes by developing the mind in the Brahma Viharas that is blameless into, in the sense that it actually leads us to the cessation of suffering. But when we're talking about instead pursuing all of these tiny bits of sukha, I mean, we're actually worse probably than a heroin addict in the sense that at least the, the heroin I think lasts a little bit longer than um, whatever kind of shot that we're having with you know ice cream or other or other types of um, sensual pleasures and it's blameful to the extent that it actually just leads us to more and more suffering as we see you know how much ice cream even the most delicious ice cream do you need to have in order to realize that it's unsatisfying how many of us have had stomach aches by eating like way too much <laughs> ice cream, for example, when perhaps we were a little bit depressed and then we did it again and then again and then again and then again and then again. <laughs> so there is this, that kind of like it's never enough and we also never learn. So in the best case scenario, we're always at the same kind of like depressed, mediocre sort of state of being, or in the best case, in, in the worst case scenario, we actually increase suffering because we're like, okay, this ice cream clearly is not that great. So let me 
try heroin yeah once again like because at least that like lasts a little bit longer and of course all of those degrees and then harming not only ourselves but others in order to get what we think others have that is going to make us happy and so forth so that piles up this huge 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 big um big pile of suffering for ourselves and and others so yes sukha is something to be pursued skillfully um so to fully understand our experience fully understand how we get tricked fully understand the gratification the danger and the escape so you know the gratification to a certain extent we all pretty much know more or less uh, of sensual pleasures the danger well not really otherwise we wouldn't be so obsessed with pursuing them so we reflect on the danger we reflect on the impermanence we reflect on all the the drawbacks of of pursuing sensual pleasures and so forth and um the unreliability essentially and the fact that they don't make us happy and instead of the way out of suffering that we always pick which is basically to go and search for the gratification once again we relinquish our desire for these uh, course essential pleasures and we pursue the cultivation of um, sukha so of joy and happiness in the mind as a means to an end as a means to nibbana as a means to the cessation of suffering and in the same and in the meanwhile we're also having a great time because we're like enjoying meditation instead of torturing ourselves also when we're meditating like oh in breath out breath oh dukka, 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 dukka. <laughs> instead of um stressful meditation we're actually or irritation meditation we're actually cultivating the mind and having a really great time so yeah you want to pursue sukha then cultivate your mind anything Next is a good question. Bumika asks, what is best time for meditation? Um, Dante J likes the question, so I'll yeah. pass it on to you. As long as you're awake. As long as you're awake, you meditate. <clears throat> if, if, <laughs> if you think meditation is um, from 4 to 4.30 and from 6 to 7.30 or whatever, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> the best time for meditation is whenever you're awake. Because right? the practice, the Buddha says, even in the Metta Sutta, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or whenever we're awake, one should develop this mindfulness, right? So the Buddha says, whenever you're awake, that's the time to practice. Now, to be a little bit less, I mean, it's true. Everything I said is exactly true. But I think what you mean is kind of like, well, should I meditate in the morning? Should I meditate in the afternoon, like an official sit or walking meditation? And that you have to find out for yourself. For some people, the morning is great. Some people, the uh, the evening is great. Um, you have to try it out, try different schedules, try different times, and then figure out what works for you. And then once you do that, stick with it. Like for for instance, for me, you know, I when I started out years and years and years ago, it was just like, okay, well, you know, uh, half hour in the morning, half hour in the evening, and meditation in the evening never stuck with me. Even to this day, it doesn't really work well for me meditating in the evening, but meditating in the morning and it got to the point where I, I decided to go to bed earlier so I could wake up earlier to meditate more in the morning. Right. And that that was years of figuring out what worked best for me. And that's what I did. And I didn't feel bad like, oh, no, they say I should meditate in the evening. No, my practice was progressing very well. I was developing very well and I and I was doing what worked for me. And that's how it goes. Great, thank you very much. And Jaika asks, do you have advice for differentiating between Neva Sanya Sanya and Danimitta Samadhi? They seem almost identical. That's a great question for Banka mm -hmm. Sukhaso. So they're actually quite different. So the practice of Animitta Samadhi, the mind is completely awake. It's very sharply, clearly alert. But the mind is not fixating on any particular object, process, or experience. Uh, so the mind is, is immediately letting go of every object that appears, yet the mind is completely awake and alert. By contrast, the state of neva sanya na sanya, so neither perception nor non-perception, uh, in the suttas, it's defined as being a state which is almost like being completely unconscious. 
the mind is just barely, barely, barely not totally asleep. So you're technically not completely unconscious, but you're so close that the mind is, is effectively utterly non-functional for a period of time. So it's notable that Neva Sanya Na Sanya is uh, one of the very few states of mind in which it is completely impossible to cultivate uh, insight because the mind is, is almost utterly unconscious. Or it's just one step shy of being completely unconscious. Uh, whereas the state of Anamitta Samadhi, the mind is completely awake, completely alert, and clearly knowing, yet it is not generating any distinction or separation between objects. Uh, so the, the concept of separate phenomenon of, of distinct formations is, is dropped. The mind is not separating things apart. But it's still completely awake and completely knowing. I think Jay Lyle's asked the exact same question, no? Uh, actually, this is, yeah, it's almost the same question. Yeah. So this one is, I just answered this one as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. And Scott says, regarding metta and healing, and this is directly mm -hmm. directed to Bhante J. Regarding metta and healing, with metta in my heart, I notice that people around me tend to open up and speak their own dhamma, which may be healing. What are your thoughts? So I, th I think this is a response. Remember, was it last week or whatever, when somebody asked about metta and healing and I said metta is not magic? Remember that? Mm. I think it was just the two of us. Um, yeah. yeah. So... <clears throat> Metta has some, when you really, really seriously practice metta, it has some interesting impacts on the people around you. It really does. And not only just people, but even all beings, right? The, the benefits of metta, dear to human beings, dear to non human beings, right? So, and if you've had the chance to be around somebody who really, really like emanates metta, like one time in my life, I, I, met this monk and uh it was like there was this fear around him and you enter this fear and you feel totally like like safe and that you're not going to be judged at all and it's just like this amazing feeling of meta um and so yeah these things can happen it's quite interesting like i've even i practice lots of methods of spiders and I've had weird things with spiders happen. Um, like, for instance, a, a spider doing walking meditation with me. Oh, Yes, cute. that actually literally happened. Oh, so After cute. the third time, it turned around and walked the same way. I was like, okay, this is definitely true. This is, this is not me imagining something. This is really weird. <laughs> right? So, so, no, like metta, you know, so, yeah, if you practice lots of metta, yes, what, what happens is, if you're around somebody with metta, they you they feel that they can trust you, right? They feel this openness, right? And so this, they they tend to open up and speak their own dhamma. I, hopefully, it's good dhamma in line with the dhamma. But <laughs> but no, that's good. That that's good. If you practice lots of metta, then you can you can experience that, and people can be very open to you. I I remember, I work child protective services. Uh, as my career before I became a monk. And I, let's see, 2006, I started, I became a, I became a Buddhist about a year and a half, two years in. So for the majority of my time as at working this, I was practicing metta and I was practicing, and especially after I started practicing metta, there were two types of beings who really noticed it, children and dogs. Ooh. Because I kept getting like I would and my job, part of my job was, especially during when I was doing investigations, was walking into a random stranger's house. Right. And so I'd walk into a random stranger's house and their kid would just come right up to me. Right? Or their dog would come right up to me. And I kept getting multiple, multiple times. This was just this was not just once or twice. It just kept happening to the point where it's like, oh, I wonder if it's the meta. I kept getting the mom would say. That's funny. My child usually doesn't go up to strangers like that. My dog usually doesn't go up to, do, to strangers like that. And I remember this one time I had to I had to deliver this message to this cult kind of compound in the woods. 
And I went and there, nobody was home, but there was like 13 dogs. <laughs> and I'm like, <sighs> should I? And so I just walked very slowly and I just emanated Metta and all of these, I mean, some of them were, didn't look too scary and some of them looked pretty scary. And I just very slowly, calmly emanating Metta and I went and I, put the letter on the house and then I walked back and I got into my car and I was like, oh. <laughs> so yeah, metta, metta is powerful, right? This is where it, part of the 11 benefits of metta is uh, fire, poison, and sword cannot touch one. Now, I, I hesitate strongly to take this literally. Just because you practice lots of method doesn't mean you're like Superman. You just like put out your chest and like knives and bullets and stuff just bounce off. This is not what this means. However, if you practice lots of metta and you emanate lots of metta, because you are dear to human beings and non-human beings, they will let be much less likely to want to harm you. Right? They will rather be very open like this, like you say. So yeah, practice lots of metta and you'll see how much it benefits yourself and how much that impacts the people that you meet. Thank you, Bhaktim. And Shadow of Label asks, my mother died three years ago. How do I know which heaven she went to given my study of multiple religions? Well, first of all, Shadow of Label, I'm very sorry to, to hear. And uh, in terms of the heaven realms, um, well, between Buddhism and other religions, normally there's not much difference in terms of, of heaven realms. The only difference is that it's impermanent, also hell realms as well. Um, so we also have hell realms in Buddhism, but just like <laughs> heavenly realms, they're impermanent. That's the only major difference, say, between uh, say Buddhism and Catholicism. With Catholicism, you get one heaven or one hell, or we also introduced purgatory. <laughs> I think only the purgatory is actually impermanent, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. in Catholicism. But the heaven or hell, then you're there for the rest of your days. In Buddhism, it can be a little bit longer or a little bit shorter but it's always impermanent there will be an end the only thing that is not impermanent is nibbana uh, which is why we're also aiming for that not also why we're aiming for that without the also um so may your mom attain supreme blissful nibbana and you as well and jay lai says is it wise to sit in meditation for six hours per day as a lay person Sure, if you have the time, yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Or more, even, <laughs> if you have the time. Yeah. Six hours straight? Great. <laughs> and Scott says, Recently I have come across a psychologist who disputes the existence of the mind. This opinion sure gave rise to aversion in this mind. I came back to the reflection that mind is one of the sense doors. Any more advice? What else is the mind? Okay. I find this absolutely hilarious that in that psychologist's mind, they <laughs> thought it was perfectly fine for them to speak their mind about their belief that there is no mind. Like this is just absolutely mind blowing. It's kind of like a fish swimming in the water saying there's no such thing as water. Uh, it's, it's actually even weirder than that. Like literally everybody's experience is entirely mind. So saying there is no mind is, is just absolutely mind-bogglingly absurd. <laughs> I mean, we, I mean, you want to get into really refined points of Buddhist philosophy, we can say that the mind cannot be said either to exist or to not exist. We can get into those kinds of interesting discussions. Um, but to say that mind flatly does not exist, that's just craziness. I, I'm sorry, there's, there's no way around it. It's just craziness. You can dispute the existence of the body. That is rational, but disputing the existence of the mind gets pretty wacky. 
this is a weird I, I wonder if this psychologist was talking was thinking about the existence of the mind outside of the brain maybe i think so like, like, i don't know i've never heard of somebody literally say dispute the existence of mind period like that that's I've never heard that ever. I have, that's like, weird. and it's usually in those terms, Monte, yeah. I think mm -hmm. so as well. That's normally what the kind of narrative is, mm -hmm. that it, we're just, that the mind is just a bunch of neurons uh, transmitting, mm -hmm. like, frequencies and blah, 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 yeah, blah. Like, the scientific, the, the, the common scientific <laughs> understanding I understand of mind is, like, brain is the hardware, mind is the software. That's what they, they say, because it's, like, the mind is essentially the software that's running from the brain. Um, which is kind of and definitely not exactly what we, what Buddhism says. Mind is different. Um, but it, I think it also can also fulfill that role in a way. It's like, you know, using the brain, like using, just like it's using the body, right? The mind is, yeah, anyway. That's yeah, but <clears throat> it's all speculative views. Actually, that's yeah. one of the biggest problems that Western science has is that they can't really understand what consciousness is or what the mind is and so then they're looking in material answers um when buddhism has all the answers <laughs> this is the the only thing that i've ever heard described as the big problem is consciousness i've never heard anything in science it's like what's the big problem oh consciousness yeah because yeah it's a hard one or the hard problem i'm sorry the hard problem yeah Oh, Diego <laughs> said Yay. he read the Trigata. Mm -hmm. And enjoyed it thoroughly. Oh, yeah. I'm glad to hear. Yeah, it's without question. It's the best English translation of the Trigata currently available. That's very kind, Bante, but... I'm not kidding. <laughs> I don't think so, but I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Um, Martin says, would the first jhana or the second jhana be possible without at least some sukha? No. Uh, so by definition, first and second jhana contain piti and sukha, mm -hmm. which uh, I usually translate as euphoria and happiness or euphoria and pleasure. But it's specifically defined as the euphoria and pleasure that comes through seclusion and concentration, which is very different from the euphoria and pleasure that comes from, say, eating ice cream and listening to music. So uh, the difference is quite dramatic. Uh, so they're both pleasant experiences, but the euphoria and pleasure that comes through seclusion and concentration is extremely peaceful, clear, refined, and incredibly strong. It's a very, very strong, intensely pleasant experience. And in fact, it directly supports samadhi. It's both born from samadhi and also it supports the development of samadhi, the growth of samadhi. Uh, but this has, this has absolutely nothing to do with uh, listening to Bach, for example. Um, in the next part here, he mentions things like art and listening to Bach. So, uh, well, one, I never liked Bach. Uh, Beethoven was much better, but that's a completely different story. Um, art. Yeah, I mean, you can sit around looking at art and listening to music all day long and not be one step closer to jhana. <laughs> and um, I'll address this too, since it was directed to what I was saying earlier. That, um, so Martin's follow-up is, I agree with everything that's been said on ice cream. It's not healthy. It leaves us unsatisfied. But would you dare say the same things on art? the music of Bach, for example, art can be such a great teacher and such a powerful source of joy. It reminds me of my um, version of self when I had met Bante Sudazo. <laughs> Actually, art used to be my religion. Um, <laughs> so I was very, very hurt when um, Bante Sudazo's version of uh, several years ago, challenged my religion. Mm. <laughs> and actually, I would get really infuriated. Um, <laughs> and the reality is that, you know, we tend to think, okay, ice cream, this course, essential pleasure, but oh, bah, that refined 
sensual pleasure. Yes, it's a refined sensual pleasure, but it's still the same thing. And actually for, for some people who have a taste for that, can be incredibly beautiful. And for others, it can be utter torture. So it's not that it's inherently superior or inherently inferior or equal. It's just a predilection that we have for particular um, sensual experiences based on different causes and conditions that we put in place that are quite irrelevant to the path of awakening. So it's not that someone who has really refined taste in music and art uh, will have an easier time to uh, bring to this bring suffering to a cessation so attain nibbana than someone who's only you know pursued in such only interest in sensual pleasures is eating ice cream and i don't know um putting paint on their fingers and going like that you know and then we're like and liking it um so oh, it's just finger <laughs> yeah, finger painting thank you <laughs> it's just like a value judgment that we give and so we can get actually very much confused in terms of um, refinements of sensual pleasure. It's actually more, more and more caught up with things. But in reality, you know, coming from Italy, I have to say, where we actually kind of somewhat, if not perfected, really made really complicated the world of sensuality. Like there's a lot of refinement of, yeah, of different types of foods, refinement of different types of architecture, refinement of different types of music and smells and this and that. And also there's lots of, all of these are connected to social classes. So it also comes with a lot of self-importance, you know, if you know the particular right tastes and the particular fabric, et cetera, et cetera. You know, coming to the United States where, you know, actually... When I first moved here, it was very difficult for me to understand um, the when I was in a really upscale neighborhood. Like for example, here in New Jersey, at the very beginning, I was I did not realize that I was walking in an upscale neighborhood <laughs> because the houses are exactly the same to me as the ones of the poor neighborhood. <laughs> They're literally exactly the same. They're just a little bit bigger. And they have the same grass. It's just that one is a little bit dirtier and then that one is a little bit cleaner and one is a little bit greener and the other one is a little bit like, you know, uh, darker, just not watered all the time because maybe the people need to work more or something or they can't afford people. But essentially, it's the same kind of thing. And, you know, my perception of Americans is that, you know, with wealth, they're kind of like, it's always the same thing. It's just that, you know, one per poor person has only one glass as opposed to made of plastic and the rich person has 10 made of plastic, but it's still like the same kind of plastic thing. There's no fun actually being rich in America, to be quite frank. <laughs> like you go to the rest of the world, like any place that I've been, it's very clear when you are in a rich neighborhood, you know, like what rich see, like, you know, I'm friend from Sri Lanka she's like yes yes you know it's very very clear but here everybody's in sneakers and like leggings it doesn't matter if they're like really rich or there it's just that maybe they have the latest model so I guess why I'm sharing this is that when you move to a different culture or different country it's kind of really easy to see what like the sort of the the um, emptiness, not in the Buddhist term, but actually also in the Buddhist term of like, yeah, it's just, you know, a bunch of crap that people might get uh, really into it. But it's very difficult when it's your own crap, like when it's your own <laughs> sort of culture where it has a lot of meaning. And I'll tell you another story of when I ordained that was really clear to me. Before I ordained, I had a bunch of different things that really meant so much to me and my four friends in fashion in Italy. And so <laughs> uh, some of the things I gave to my friends from my previous life, and this life. And then I have this like book that was like this really incredible book from Maurizio Cattelan. And it's like limited edition. If you're in the arts, you might know who Maurizio Cattelan is. And I was like, oh, I'll give it to this Mm, girl mm, you know in our my buddhist circle who i really like and she's such a great practitioner and i really want to give her this beautiful object i'm sure she's gonna like it and i gave it to her <laughs> she was like <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I don't have room for this thing in my, in my small New York apartment. And in that moment, you know, I was like flabbergasted because for me, it meant like kind of like I had given her gold and she was like, what is this feces? Why are you trying to like, <laughs> you know, like get this uh, like rubbish, um, just toss it like there's the garbage. But it was such an incredible teaching because in that moment, I realized how hung up I was on all these different things and how they are just, you know, they have value because we put value into it, but they're not. Yeah, they're just. They're impermanent, unsatisfying, and yeah, unreliable. So cultivate the sense. If you want to cultivate the sukha, cultivate the mind. Oh, well. <laughs> and Animus says, if you were in deep meditation and was absorbed in this bright white light and you felt your body separating from your consciousness, then someone makes a noise. It jolts you out of meditation. This besieged, 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 besieged. Yeah. <clears throat> this happened many times. How can I get past noise bothering me? One tip. Felt the body separating from your consciousness. That sounds like falling asleep. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this this doesn't sound like samadhi to me. Either. I don't know this, what this, this is. This sounds like spacing out. Yeah. Yeah, this, this it, doesn't sound good at all. Which, no. if you have like a shot, like a sound, then that will kind of jolt you out. Like my experience is if you actually are in like a deep samadhi or whatever like that, you hear a sound. It doesn't matter how long and large it is. It's just like, oh, it's just there. Like it doesn't like take you out i i think that yeah <laughs> maybe you were in in uh bante g's wrong fourth jhana i.e falling asleep <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry it took me a second <laughs> that's great yeah. and richard said yesterday during my meditation i started body scanning when i got to my neck suddenly i said to myself where am i i finally realized there isn't any me physically located in this body it was strange, beautiful, slightly confusing, but clear. I felt lighter, calmer, and had a better understanding of the four elements. However, I still struggled to completely see the body as the four elements exclusively. Where do I go from here? Subhasu? By practicing the six elements. That's the next step. Then it becomes complete. So number five is space. Akasa Datu, and number six is consciousness, Vinyana Datu. Uh, then you have a complete set. Uh, but it sounds like you're making great progress, so congratulations, keep going. Don't stop there. Um, bring it deeper, make it broader, make it stronger. Thank you. And uh, our friends here are confirming that this psychologist only believes in brain. Mm -hmm. And Diego says, eliminativism in philosophy yeah. is a position that believes some, sometimes many, mental states do not really exist. It's kind of nuts, but such is philosophy. I love your last. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's my <laughs> feeling of philosophy. <laughs> kind of nuts, but such is philosophy. And Jay Lyle says, how would you assign Pali words to experiences like vibrations, vertigo, tinnitus, and pulsations of energy? Vedana. All of those are called Vedana. Mm -hmm. And all of them are completely meaningless. <laughs> and should be seen as impermanent, unsatisfying, and impersonal. Mm -hmm. You say Western science, psychology is so material, but does that also relate to Freud? He analyzed the mind so carefully. He detected aggression, anger. He also analyzed in detail many of the things, the hindrances that the Buddha spoke about. Um, and is there a continue? Doesn't look like. Okay. So I would say To be quite frank, I haven't really studied Freud that much or any psychology that much. Um, I mean, 
to the extent that that I found necessary, but it never actually, the only thing that really got me in um, into the study of the mind was really Buddhism. But in terms of psychology in general, it's not that one dismisses Western psychology. Actually, I think it's it can be a really extremely good, useful tool, but it's not the same as Buddhism. So I would say that actually psychology can have um, can offer some really great tools to understand some some of the kilesas that we are really um, immersed in that we're really suffering with that we can't be objective with that we can't really um really deal with or also like kilesas that have gone completely um beyond because we haven't actually trained the mind so a mind that is untrained can, can really like be a disaster and this is like the words of the buddha actually it's like there's nothing more horrible more harmful than an untrained mind and it's nothing more like incredible and skillful than a trained mind so if we don't train our mind we're going to rack up like so many difficult horrible habits and habits are really pernicious you know actually my mom is currently visiting here and um sometimes she when she does the actually all the times when she does the dishes she puts the uh dry dish to on the left hand side, even though clearly to the right, there's the dish rack. And she puts it on the left hand side because in our house in Rome, the dish rack is on the left side. So it doesn't matter that she knows that now she's been here for a couple of days, actually weeks now that it's on the right. It's the habit is so strong that then she'll go like, oh, wait, I put it here. Oh, it's the habit, right? So something as trivial as putting the, you know, the dishes, the dry dishes somewhere when you're used to putting it in another place can be very, very challenging and difficult. Sometimes it can also happen here at Empty Cloud if we're sitting in a different place, right? And we're used to like bowing to the Buddha three times, right? So if tomorrow the Buddha is going to be here, maybe we're going to turn here because we're used to it. So this is habits of mind, um, can be very strong so you just imagine the habit of anger the habit of uh, killing the habit of all sorts of habits that we have the habit of yelling and so forth the habit of repression so then these habits can create other sort of manifestations of lots of different other kilesas that can be quite unruly and can also be pathologies neurosis and so forth that I feel Western psychology is very good at addressing and delving deeply into it and sort of unwrapping. And um, I really like what Bhante Sujato says that Buddhism starts when psychology ends. So it's not that like, you know, once we, for example, start a psychological path, it will lead us towards awakening. No, that's not the purpose of psychology. The purpose of psychology, I mean, if you go to a therapist and you tell them, I want to be free from greed, hatred, and delusion, they're going to say you're completely insane and crazy. That's impossible. Um, so what they, the purpose is to get you to a sort of manageable state of greed, hatred, and delusion uh, so that you don't kill people, you don't harm yourself, and um, you're somewhat safe uh, to be around in society and you're also like okay with uh, just coping with samsara to a certain degree or the other and you kind of understand where things are are coming from and then you can start the work of uprooting all the defilements so i forgot where i was going for, from here from freud <laughs> but um yeah it's just yeah, I wouldn't say that psychology is material, uh, but definitely, I don't know, it looks sometimes, it's not a perfect match and a perfect overlap with uh, with Buddhism, actually quite the opposite. They have two different purposes. Sud said, dear venerables, how does one enter jhana from metta meditation? Do you eventually drop the thoughts like me? We all live in friendship and focus on the feeling or does it just happen automatically? Okay, Jay. Well, I've never gotten to jhana from metta, but <laughs> but um, so metta is can be considered a samatha meditation, um, and you can get into those deep states of samadhi. I think <clears throat> I think what happens is that 
my experience is the deeper you go, the, the, the processes are almost automatic in a way. It's not like you're not trying to force something or create something or get into something. It's what arises when the causes and conditions in the mind are right. So if you're doing metta and you're practicing metta and you don't have any of the five hindrances, um, you know, and such, then uh, maybe there will come a time where you will um, stop doing the, the the voices. And I think that that is something that can naturally happen as you get more calm, to be honest with you. Like a lot of times when I practice metta, there's no vocalization whatsoever. It's just, it's just visual or just, you know, feeling and, and, um, but even in first jhana, there's Vitaka Vichara. So technically, it is possible that, you know, because the conditions are ripe and you just slip right into first jhana, even while you're saying may all beings live in, you know, I think once you get in there, you get further than that will drop. But yeah, I, I can't go any more clear than that. I don't know. Bonte, do you want to say something? or? No, I think that sums it up yeah. pretty well. Okay, hey, Jay Kala says, it's an interesting reflection that the gods of creation are higher than the gods who enjoy more coarse pleasures and the sensual realm. Art creativity seems to be the most refined form of pleasure, yet still unworthy. Well, isn't isn't even higher the gods who, who revel in other people's creations? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like the creators and the ones who are just hanging out just so, oh, that's pretty neat. Actually, Paranimitavasavati means those who control the creations of others. Oh, Vasavati oh. means uh, exercising authority or power. Hmm. So it's often translated incorrectly as those who delight in the creations of others, but it actually hmm. means those who control the creations of others. Yeah. You know, as a late person, I was in the fashion industry and there was definitely all these like states <laughs> and they were fun, yet still unworthy. <laughs> and Dao says, art might be considered more refined, but in the end, there isn't much of a difference between pleasure from ice cream and an art. Yes, we all agree. Richard says, Oh, great. I'm glad to hear Richard that is working. And Martin says, the way you talk about art reminds me of Pierre Bourdieu. Art, a means of distinction of class war, but art is much more. It connects people. It also brings beauty. Of course, beauty of an impermanent kind, but I'm not sure whether we should discuss this much further or try to find consent here. In America, there was a strong workers movement, especially in the thirties or so. They said these things, classical music, philosophy, literature, it's too important to live it to the upper class. Yeah, no, I think it's, um, I mean, all good, good points. Um, we're not trying to, at least I'm not trying to, I think actually art can be a very good means to, um somewhat warm up the the heart to spiritual practice so it's not something to throw it out the reason why i mentioned everything that i mentioned is just because you reminded me of your myself <laughs> several years ago so if we get too wrapped up then we kind of can get a little bit lost and sidetracked and um prioritize what is not necessarily that relevant and um yeah put uh, the Dhamma in second place when it should be in the first place. It should be the the foremost. And, you know, it's also worth mentioning that actually the, you know, the Pali Canon is a, is very, is a piece of art, piece of artwork. The suttas, the poems, the poetry, the Terigata, it's incredible. It's all art. So there's beautiful form through which all the teachings have been shared. And so there's a very skillful way of um, of using the arts uh, for for the benefit of ourselves and others. So yeah, absolutely. Amaranta says, uh, "Good afternoon, venerables. Here in the place where I live, I have been living very difficult moments, and I felt in danger two days ago. And thoughts of hatred about a person that we consider a symbol of the violence appeared. And even I tried to practice metta and see the non-repulsive and repulsive things didn't help. What can I do? Well, yes, that's all. 
Well, first off, it's important to practice metta all the time um, so that then when you do face difficult situations, it's easier to continue with metta rather than trying to produce metta when you're facing something difficult. Uh, but also just acknowledging that every now and then we're going to encounter situations which are beyond the limits of the current strength of our practice. And in those situations, we're going to fall back on our old unwholesome habits of mind. That's normal. That's to be expected. So in those cases, we accept that this is normal. We forgive ourselves for slipping up and we uh, try to reestablish the mind in wholesome states. Uh, when dealing with genuine, generally dangerous situations, though, it's, it's good to get out of the dangerous situation. Uh, that's more important than trying to um, maintain metta while staying in a dangerous situation. It's better to get out of the dangerous situation uh, and remember that you need to keep practicing metta in order to keep your mind stable in those conditions in the future. Thank you. Oh, and Anjan says, right after a tragic bereavement, bereavement, like somebody that he lost somebody, like oh, a mother yeah. or a father, okay. like a, a period of grieving. Yeah. I found it impossible to sit in meditation. Does this mean that meditation requires a somewhat stable state of mind? Mm -hmm. Jane? <clears throat> yeah. So when you have something that is a very, very strong experience then it's natural that you kind of it just the you know the whatever i was like oh i'm a good meditator i have this, and then my mother died i was like oh you know obviously this is normal like i i remember one of my favorite monks bante silananda sri lanka monk who's been a monk since he was a, 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 like 11 years old and he tells the story of like 15 20 years ago when um Actually, well, I guess he's ten years. Maybe he was so closer to twenty-five or thirty. I don't know. But he was he was a fairly young monk. I think maybe like in his mid twenties, and uh, or late twenties. And his father died, right? And and he said that um, when he tells the story about how when he went to give the eulogy, he says that he he forgot the dhamma. <laughs> he literally forgot that like he couldn't because he was so wrapped up in in the experience of his father dying. Um, that he couldn't like, he couldn't give like a Dhamma talk. He couldn't do what he was supposed to do as like a monastic. Mm -hmm. and, and that's normal. You know, that, that's, that, that, that's something to be expected that when you have a very, very strong tragic incident, don't even bother trying to sit in meditation. Instead, take what you're experiencing as your meditation. Right? If you are experiencing the death of a loved one, be fully there, fully understand it. Don't run away from it. Don't try to um, you know, avoid it. Be there, experience it, understand it. Right? This is the most important thing. These, it's, it's actually these kind of really strong experiences that can be very important parts of our path. I, this is, it's not that you're just like, well, I can't officially meditate because it's just uh, when I sit down, all I think about is the fact that I just lost my loved one two months ago, obviously, right? Because your mind is going to be taking many, many months, if not years to go through the process. And that's going to be uh, like a, a very, very strong part of your mental existence for that time. And that's okay. So take that as your object of meditation. Understand it. Learn from it. Right? Don't run away from it. And then you will uh, grow in wisdom and insight and know how to live better. Excellent. Thank you. And we have some um, lovely comments on practice. Um, so Jay Kala says, I have found metta and karuna very useful in some dangerous situations. Recently, I was able to calm down someone threatening to stab me with compassion and metta, but always good to know what to do. Sadhu, mm -hmm. that's a really great success story. And Martin says, Anand 
Ray touches an important point, I think. In times of crisis, I like to do devotional practice. Chanting, for example, I think it helps. I don't know if you agree here. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it warms the heart. Yeah, I mean, actually, if you find it too difficult to do formal meditation practice, then just doing a few minutes of chanting uh, can be a way to keep a sense of connection to the Dhamma. And it does it does train the mind a little bit. So it's it's still worth doing. Yeah. Yeah, actually, during long periods of personal retreat, I often wind up doing a lot more chanting uh, than I do as part of the daily monastery schedule. Richard asks, can meditation erase brain fog? It's a big part of my illness. I started meditation for the first time since April this year. Whoever I found my mind is the sharpest in recollection to date. Um, yes, absolutely. It's actually, for example, one of the very few things that can help with Alzheimer, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, so this not said by Buddhists, but actually by different scientists. So they they always recommend um, yeah different mindfulness practices and um, yeah meditation can definitely help in training the mind. That's the whole purpose of it. <laughs> so definitely brain fog um, is a side effect of that. Yeah, okay. that, in particular, practicing mindfulness of the body uh, is something which can cultivate a, a sharp, clear attentiveness of mind. All right, and that's the last question of tonight. Thank you, everyone, for um, tuning in and asking all these great questions. Uh, so if you're around in uh, New Jersey or New York, area you're always welcome on saturdays at 6 p.m for uh, meditation and dhamma talk and on sunday the whole day uh, we have usually in the morning some karma yoga so volunteers come and help out with different chores at the monastery then um, if people bring food uh, which so far has always happened every time then there's um, the lunch dana and then in the afternoon we have uh, an afternoon of mindfulness so with uh, more dhamma talks and meditation practice etc but actually i think we have a last um two last questions chikala says i assume like the course with pantianalio public through his center university or is it a private group it's actually um through um their group but it's in italian so it's um <laughs> it's with the folks in italy um, but it worked with, um, since it's in the evening in Italy, it's perfect. It's just after lunch here. So, so it works well. And Diego says, the Satipatthana Sutta says things like, in regards to the body, one abides contemplating the body. Why the repetition? What's the meaning? And there's, there's different opinions on this, but the one that makes most sense to me is that it's emphasizing that one is paying attention to the body on its own terms. So not as one conceives it or thinks it or imagines it, but as it actually is. So uh, contemplating the body, paying attention to the body as a body, not as a mental concept of a body, not as an idea of a body, but as a body itself, as the actual physical experience itself. That's what I think the purpose of that is. And remember Diego also is, uh, English would be his second or however many languages too. So this is somebody trying to figure out why is this? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that was really the different, the last question. <laughs> and Martin says, it's 2.47 AM in Germany now. Oh, wow. We really are impressed by your commitment to the Dhamma staying, <laughs> doing the after hours uh, to listen to the to monk chat. All right. So we can end with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May you all be well and happy. May all good things.